Um, just as a reminder, you have to start with the blank Excel file whenever you are being tested. Uh, you can't use a previous homework assignment. You can't use a uh, uh, in-class exercise that you'd started up. You have to just start with a blank worksheet if you're going to be using Excel. And uh, the exam will have at least one case where you need to use Excel to solve the test. All right, so today we're going to talk about water hammer and surge tanks. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, how many of those are supposed to be in Excel? I know if you have a checklist, you can mm -hmm. find how much of those are you supposed to use. No, there is not a set of headings that you're supposed to use. Um, you know, there's uh, a lot of different ways to implement, like the Hayes and Williams, or excuse me, the Hardy Cross method. And so um, I don't insist that you follow that same set of column headings that I've given you in the past. When I've provided that, it was mainly just to kind of kickstart the process uh, so that you had a, a format to begin with. So, I mean, do you have to memorize it? No, but you do have to know the method well enough that you can replicate it starting with a blank worksheet. And so, yeah. Are there other questions? Yeah. Um, so we have exam on the 26th, which, if I'm not mistaken, is a Tuesday. Is that right? So it will include the uh, material that we'll have on the Thursday before that. Other questions about the exam? All right, so this is the Hazen Williams practice problem that you just <coughs> solved. And uh, we have water flowing through a plastic pipe where we know the unit weight of water, we know the C value of the pipe, the diameter is given, and the flow rate. So anytime you have both the diameter and the flow rate, then your mind should immediately jump to the fact that you can calculate the uh, velocity relatively easy. And that's nice because uh, if you want to calculate the head loss due to pipe friction, one of the direct input variables you're going to have to have is the velocity. Let's see if we've got everything else we need to use this head loss formula. Because what we're trying to find is uh, the pressure downstream, uh, the pressure change. We don't know the absolute pressure at the upstream location. We just want to find out the delta P over the course of 250 meters. And so we've got the velocity. We've got the C value, the diameter is a given, the length 250 meters, and so we have everything we need to calculate the head loss. And uh, although it's not on the page there, and maybe you don't have to write it in order to solve this problem, I think it's always useful to write the energy equation just as uh, maybe a starting point because it'll help trigger in your mind where this is all heading. And so here's the uh, energy equation on the board. All right, so we've got the pressure head, elevation head, and velocity head at one. Each of those same terms at location two, which is the downstream location, plus the h sub f. Now, if it only says one pipe diameter, then that means that it's a constant diameter through the entire pipeline. So if D1 equals D2, what does that tell us about the velocities? The velocities are equal, so it can be canceled out of the uh, energy equation term because they're the same. So we only really need to keep track of the differences on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation. All right, so that's kind of uh, where this is headed. So if you've calculated the flow rate, you need to put it in terms of cubic meters per second. And then the pipe diameter gives us the cross-sectional area, and we get the velocity of the water flowing through this pipe. And then into the Hayes and Williams equation, we find that between these two points, 250 meters apart, we're going to be losing about 16 meters of head. And so that's an energy loss due to pipe friction. So the pressure change, though, is dependent on more than just that. That alone would cause the pressure downstream to be lower. But then it also says in the problem statement that this downstream location is higher in elevation. And so that hydrostatic effect and the loss of pressure just by virtue of it being elevated is also going to have an effect 
And so we can rearrange the energy equation to solve for the delta P. And uh, by the way, this is a pressure loss, but the delta P is positive because of the way we've defined delta P. We're saying that the delta P is P1 minus P2. And so we understand that the upstream location has more pressure. The downstream pressure, uh, the downstream pressure is going to be less. And so therefore, that's why the delta P, it's implied that it's a reduction in pressure. So this is a reduction in pressure in the amount of about 240 kilopascals because the pressure change depends on the head loss and the Z. I just threw this together really quickly before class did. Anybody else get the same thing, 240 kilopascals? Good, good, good. All right, any questions about the example? Yes? Good question. All right. Um, the, the problem statement just tells us that the pipe diameter is 100 millimeters. And so if we do like a sketch of this pipe, it's inclined, so I'm going to be drawing it like this. Here's our location one. Here's our location two. And so the diameter at this first spot is the same thing. So it's 100 millimeters here. And it's also, at this spot, 100 millimeters. And so what we can say is that the velocity at 1 is uh, 2.8 meters per second. And the velocity at 2 is 2.8 meters per second. Now, we don't have to cancel out the velocity heads. We can put them in there. But it's not going to have an effect on the answer, because whatever this velocity head is, so 2.8 squared divided by 2 times 9.81, that same number is going to be on the left side and the right side. So we can add it or cancel it, but it's not going to end up changing the, uh, the answer either way. Are there other questions? All right. OK, so Hayes and Williams. Now, what we're going to be talking about as kind of the new material today is a phenomenon known as water hammer. And so there's a, uh, a message board where young engineers were talking about some of their failures, the most expensive mistakes they've made before. And uh, this was one of the responses. So let me pause for a moment and let you read this. So if you're working for minimum wage as a lifeguard, you don't want to be costing the city $800,000 in damage. Now, as you're going to learn a little bit later on, uh, the effect of water hammer has been mischaracterized a little bit here. It's not a burst of air. It's natural why people would think maybe it's a burst of air, but we're going to get into like the, the background science of what a water hammer actually is. But the implication, like the risk of water hammer, is accurately portrayed in this description. Uh, essentially, what can happen during a water hammer is a really high surge of pressure can go through a pipeline, and uh, fittings can leak, or pipes can burst, and flooding occurs. So this is just a beautiful car underwater to illustrate that uh, high water can cause problems. So let's watch a couple of video clips to give us uh, a look at the different manifestations of water hammer. It's something that you can see in your own house occasionally, although it's a lot less risky when it's in your house than when it's in a, a big full-size water pipeline. Now, this person can get water coming from the faucet and just fine, but things start to go a little bit strange when the valve is closed, and especially when the valve is closed quickly. So let's watch another one of these videos of a washing machine. What's happening with this washing machine is um, it's metering in just a little bit of water 
into the front-loading washing machine. How many people here have used a front-loader before? Some of you. They say the advantage of a front-loading washing machine over the top-loading is that the front-loading washing machines use less water. And there's a sensor inside the washing machine that can detect how many clothes you've got in there, and it kind of adds water accordingly. So if it's a big load and you need a lot of water to wash it, then it'll put in more water. And if it's a light load, it doesn't use as much water. So it's very efficient. They save like 80% of the water that you'd normally use. But what happens is it's measuring the amount of uh, clothes that's in there, and it'll spin it around, and it'll detect, all right, how much water is there, how much more water is needed. So it's not a, like a simple top loader just adds water until it's full and then it starts agitating. But this, it just keeps metering in a little more water and a little more and a little more. And so inside of that washing machine is a valve that's opening and closing, opening and closing. And so what you're seeing when the, it showed that uh, water line kind of quivering a little bit is that's the effect of the valve that's been opened and suddenly closed. And so what this person is suggesting is putting in some sort of, you can think of it as a shock absorber. Similar to if you were driving down the road without any shocks, think about how bumpy that would be. Inside of this is a spring that can compress and kind of take some of the shock out of that sudden opening and closing of the valve. All right, so there's one more video that we'll take a look at that goes into a cutaway animation of what's happening during water hammer. So that's obviously a very dated video clip. It looks like it maybe came from the 80s or something. But even in the 80s, they knew that if you want to prevent water hammer, the number one thing you can do is close valves slowly. All right, so let's go into the fundamentals of what's causing this in the first place. This sketch is showing water that's flowing from a tank through a pipe, and it's in steady state right now. What we see is there's some velocity that the water is moving through the pipe. And because of frictional losses, you can see that here we have an H sub F at a downstream location where the valve is located. Uh, there's a velocity head that's associated with just the amount of energy in the, in the water that's moving. So water is flowing freely. And we're going to zero in on just a certain control volume of the water. So consider the water that's immediately upstream of the valve. And the reason why we're going to look at it is we're going to consider the flow in to the control volume, the flow out of the control volume, and the difference between the two that may cause some imbalance in forces. So under steady state condition, the flow in and the flow out are equal. And so there's not going to be any, uh, any change in force that's arising. You remember the momentum equation back from fluid mechanics said that there will be an imbalance in force if there's a difference in the velocities. But right now, under steady conditions, the in and the out are equal. And so regardless of what's the flow rate or regardless of what's the density of the fluid, there isn't going to be any change in force that arises. Flow in and flow out has to be the case for the continuity equation, where there's no place inside of this full pipe for the water to be stored or accumulated, then in and out have to be equal, uh, except for that water is very slightly compressible. And that's what happens when the valve is suddenly closed. What occurs is that there's an accumulation of water near the valve itself for two reasons. The first reason that there's an accumulation of water just near the valve is that the water's slightly compressible. And the other thing that starts to happen is that the pipe will expand very suddenly. Um, and the reason why the pipe is expanding and why the water is compressing is that there's an increased force just near the, the valve. Remember in the video, it was making the point that if you have um, 100 pounds of water, moving seven miles an hour, and then suddenly it stops, it's like you're striking a blow against the valve with a hammer. The way to think about it in terms of this equation is that just temporarily, the flow in to our control volume is larger than the flow out, because we've stopped the flow out because of the valve. 
You know, the valve is in close proximity to the outflow end of this control volume, but there's still, just for a few milliseconds, water flowing into the control volume. So there's, uh, you, you can think of it in terms of convective acceleration. Remember, the, the different kinds of acceleration we discussed last semester, the local acceleration is what we usually think of. You know, the local acceleration was a change in velocity with respect to time. Who remembers what convective acceleration is? It's a change in velocity with respect to position. Very good. And so what's happening when you first instantaneously close that valve is that the velocity isn't the same everywhere. The velocity of the water just next to the valve is zero, but as you get further away from the valve, the water's still moving. And so you've got a difference in velocity, and now consider what the momentum equation would say about that. If you've got a change in velocity, there's going to be a change in force. And so we've got some force over a cross-sectional area, meaning the cross-sectional area of the pipe, and that causes an increase of pressure. Uh, so let's look at some of the uh, attributes of the sketch here. You can see that they're saying that the velocity is zero because the valve has been closed. Now the, uh, we had an energy grade line that was sloped downward in the direction of flow. Now the energy grade line is horizontal because the water stopped moving. So there's no more energy loss in the direction of flow. In fact, this is showing a delta H that is positive, there's more energy near the valve than there is as you get further away from the valve. And the reason why there's an increase in energy near the valve is that, remember, this pressure surge has caused the uh, pipe to expand a little bit. And so there's more water inside the pipe, and the pipe has even more pressure than it did before. So there's some stored energy inside the pipe, and uh, especially close to that valve. Now, this wave of pressure reflects backward off the closed valve, and it, it reflects back towards the reservoir at a speed that's known as celerity. That's the uh, speed that a shock wave moves through a fluid. So any questions so far on what's happening or why? Now remember that uh, we usually think of water as being incompressible, but that's not strictly true. It's very slightly compressible under extremely high pressure. And likewise, pipes aren't completely rigid. You know, we can consider the material properties of pipes and see that they will expand and deform slightly. And so there's the simultaneous compression of the water and expansion of the pipes that's occurring. And it gets to the point where uh, once the shock wave has made it all the way back to the reservoir, then the pipe has expanded a certain maximal amount. And throughout the entirety of the pipe, the water velocity is zero, and there's more water inside of the pipe than there ordinarily would be because the, uh, the pressure wave expanded the pipe, and so water was sucked into the pipe, a little too much water for static conditions. Even with that valve closed, there's still now going to be a water flow because the pipe temporarily swelled up and water fl flowed in to uh, fill that void. So the entire pipe is expanded. And since there's too much energy in the pipe, now the, uh, the water flow goes from the pipe into the reservoir. And then the shock wave uh, goes the opposite direction. So in our first shock wave, the, the wave was flowing from the valve towards the reservoir. So the C is saying that there's this shock wave moving at the speed of celerity. But now, once the water begins flowing back into the reservoir, the shock wave goes from the reservoir, and it's reflected back towards the valve again. So it can ping back and forth between the closed valve and the reservoir many times before finally the uh, water hammer dissipates. And each one of those cycles, depending on the length of the, uh, of the pipe, it could be really fast or it could take a couple of seconds for the shock wave to make the round trip. It just depends on where the reservoir in question is. Now, sometimes the reservoir may be you know, out in the hills near your home. There might be an elevated reservoir that's pressurizing the entire pipe network in your area. 
Um, it could be if you have a relatively small system that the uh, nearest reservoir where the water can expand and receive that incoming flow, it might be closer and then the travel time between the two wouldn't be as high. But it's a process that's known as wave reflection and it can be really risky and uh, if there is a weak spot in the pipe due to corrosion or maybe it was installed improperly and the pipe was cut or nicked, uh, you know, there's a variety of things where uh, it can find the, the weakest point in the network and uh, burst the pipe. So we often think of water as being incompressible, um, but what this uh, diagram on the left is showing is that when you have water molecules, there's a variety of different ways that they can be packed together depending on what the pressure is, and some of them are slightly more space efficient than others. So that if there's a high enough pressure, uh, rather than having kind of a random packing of the water molecules that takes very slightly more space, there can become a uh, more organized and neatly packed, you know, the water molecules are repelling each other because of the, uh, uh, the hydrogen bonds, but with enough pressure, uh, this compressibility has the effect of organizing the water molecules as they're adjacent to each other, and uh, this is showing that it's relatively, the, the compressibility of water is relatively insensitive to temperature, uh, but compressibility is a change in unit volume uh, that's arising from some change in pressure between the before and the after state. Uh, rather than speaking about compressibility, when we're doing calculations, we'll have the inverse of that. The bulk modulus of elasticity is looking at how some uh, change in pressure affects the specific volume. And so, how much volume is occupied by a kilogram of water under normal conditions? One kilogram of water is how much volume? What's that? It's a liter. Yeah, a cubic meter has a thousand um, liters, and a cubic meter of water is a thousand kilograms. So one liter of water weighs a kilogram. Well, it has a mass of a kilogram. So what this is saying is the specific volume is going to change when you have some pressure that's being applied. And we can look up the bulk modulus of elasticity from various tables. Um, in your textbook, the fluid properties are found in table 2.3. And by the way, I'll note that in your uh, in your textbook, there's a small error. It says that these numbers are uh, supposed to be divided by 10 to the 9th, but it's actually you're supposed to multiply them. So if you want to know the bulk modulus of elasticity for water at 1 Pascal, 1 times 10 to the 5th Pascals, then it's 1.93 times 10 to the 9th um, is the uh, bulk modulus of elasticity. So. The reason why we have to know the fluid properties is that the uh, speed of the water, uh, the speed of the shock wave as it moves through the water is related to the compressibility of the water. So here's the uh, bulk modulus of elasticity and the fluid density. Now this theoretical celerity is what applies if you have just an open extent of water. If the water isn't being confined and we're just thinking about how quickly can a shock wave prop propagate through the water. Um, and the shock wave, like if you're hitting a hammer um, against a plate underwater, then that wave will, um, the speed that that wave is traveling depends on the density, which of course we know temperature goes into the density. And um, it's a little bit different than if that shock, wa shock wave is confined inside of uh, a chamber, for example, inside of a pipe that can expand and contract. And so to go from the theoretical wave celerity to the actual speed of the pressure wave inside of a pipe, we have to make some adjustments. And so you'll see in the numerator here, it is taking into account the theoretical uh, celerity. But in the denominator, we're accounting for the diameter of the pipe relative to the thickness of the pipe. So that's actually talking about the wall thickness of whatever this pipe material is. And the bulk modulus of elasticity of the water, 
is in there, but then so is the material properties of the pipe. Remember, when we were looking at the step-by-step -step explanation of what causes water hammer, the pipe was swelling, and it was expanding slightly because of the increased pressure. And so we have to know how much it's going to expand, and we can get an idea of that through referring to the modulus elasticity for the pipe material itself. Now, the, uh, the shock wave begins at the valve, and it's going to go from the valve to the reservoir and then back to the valve again. And so there's a critical time parameter. The critical time parameter is you have to find out the total round trip distance, and so it's double the physical length of the pipe. And then if you know the travel speed of the shock wave, this T sub L tells you the uh, minimum amount of time that's going to cause the shock wave. So if you close the valve slower than that T sub L, then its maximum pressure can be avoided. And if you need to calculate the potential for damage, this formula can be used to understand the maximum pressure increase, or the surge. And so if we know the density, the speed of the shock wave, and then the initial velocity of the water before the valve was closed, then you can use that to calculate the uh, maximum pressure surge that can occur. The tip that they gave in the video was to close the valve slowly. The worst case scenario is that you're going to close this valve before the surge can make the round trip. Because if the valve is just partly closed when the surge makes the round trip, then some of that increase in pressure can make it through the partly open valve, and some of it will be reflected. And so um, the worst case is that it's all the way closed by the time that the shock wave gets back. All right, so I'd like you to have some practice using these equations, and I've arranged them from left to right in the roughly the uh, order you're going to need to calculate uh, what we're after here. Now, we, we know the pipe length between the valve and the reservoir, the diameter of the pipe, the material thickness that this pipe is made out of, and the properties of steel pipe. So this E sub P is the bulk modulus of elasticity for steel pipe. But what's making things a little bit tricky is that we're solving this one in traditional units. And so remember that any time you have uh, units in PSI, so that's pounds per square inch, you need to consider how it's going to be used. Down here in the uh, celerity, since it's the bulk modulus of the water divided by the bulk modulus of the pipe, that's just going to be a ratio. And so you can leave it in terms of PSI, and it will cancel out just fine. But uh, we also need to do the same thing with the diameter versus the uh, thickness of the pipe. Make sure that the units are consistent there. So you don't, my, my point is you don't necessarily have to change this PSI into PSF since we're just going to be using it in a ratio. So I'll leave you with that tip, and we'll take a few minutes to try and calculate the maximum pressure increase, and then how much time should uh, you close the valve longer than that amount. So the minimum amount of time to close the valve to avoid this maximum pressure increase. It does uh, indirectly in that we know that the viscosity and the density are going to be changing in a similar way. And all of these equations are for water. And so if you're using, if, if you have a shock wave going through like an oil, um, an oil pipeline, then everything would be different because you'd have a different bulk modulus for oil than you would for water. Well, no, the, the same equations would work. But what I'm saying is that you'd have to use different fluid properties. OK, um, so let's go through these calculations and uh, see if there's any questions. We start off knowing the length of the pipe, its diameter, the thickness of the pipe, the pipe modulus of elasticity, the water modulus elasticity, the flow rate, 
and the density of the liquid. Okay, so just from the continuity equation, we can find the velocity is 6.875 feet per second. And uh, we need to find the theoretical wave celerity. And so we need to, to do that to convert the uh, given PSI measurement of the uh, bulk modulus of elasticity for water and multiply that by 144 to get the pounds per square foot. Um, we're dividing that by the density of water and out, I say, is going to be feet per second. And uh, if you choose to worry yourself with the units, let me step you through uh, where this comes from. The uh, definition of a pound is a slug multiplied at an acceleration of one foot per second squared. So that's what a pound of force is. A pound of force is required to accelerate a slug one foot per second squared. So another way for us to rearrange that is a slug is a pound second squared divided by a feet. So I've just rearranged this in terms of slug. So it's a pound divided by a foot per second squared, which is pound second squared divided by feet. So if you're with me so far, this is the definition of a slug. And um, so here on the whiteboard, I've substituted that in uh, to look at the units on what's inside of those brackets. So we converted it to pounds per, uh, pounds per square foot in the numerator. And in the denominator is slugs per cubic foot. And then we make the substitution. Uh, well, first of all, just so that there's not so many divided bys, let's get it all so it's just on a single line. And so pounds per square foot, the square feet here go into the denominator. The uh, slugs per cubic foot, since this is in the denominator of the denominator, then that goes into the numerator. Okay, So then we've got feet in both of them, and we can cancel it out. So now it's just feet to the one power in the numerator. So it's pounds per foot divided by a slug. And then I'm making the substitution of what a slug is. The definition of a slug is it's a uh, pound second squared divided by feet. And so these feet in the denominator of slug ends up here. And then this is the pound second squared from the slug. And then from this point, we can cancel out the common units of the, uh, the pounds cancel out. These two feet aggregate together, so it's feet squared divided by second squared, and the square root of that gives us feet per second. So you can either just take it on faith that what comes out of this equation, if you're using the base units of uh, bulk modulus and density, is feet per second, or you know, here's the illustration of where these units come from. So it's 4874 feet per second. And then if we want to find out inside of the pipe, how is that wave slowed down? by the expanding pipe wall. Uh, in the case of this relatively rigid pipe, it's not slowed down a lot. If we had a, a more flexible pipe, like if the pipe material is lead, then that has a radical change in the uh, celerity of that shock wave. So in this case, the, uh, the celerity in open water would be 4874 feet per second, but that's dropped down to approximately 4,400 feet per second inside of that confined pipe. And then that can lead to a pressure change of about 407 PSI if the valve is closed instantaneously. And what we mean is if it's all the way closed within the travel time that it takes to go from the valve to the reservoir and back again. But before I move on to those time calculations, are there any questions so far on uh, determining the pressure change. I see a few of you writing, so I'll pause for a minute. I'll let you get all those numbers. The uh, example also says the minimum amount of time that you should take to close the valve to avoid that maximum pressure. So. The critical time is double the physical length. And so the physical length was 2,000 feet 
So if we have the, the round trip travel distance is 4,000 feet, that means that if you can close that valve in under 0.91 seconds, you're going to see the maximum pressure change. But if you close it more slowly than that, then you'll have less than the maximum pressure change. So it goes to the type of valve that you're using. There's, generally speaking, less of a risk of water hammer for a gate valve simply because it requires so many twists of a gate valve to finally have that gate in place, whereas uh, a globe valve or a ball valve that can be closed with just a single quarter turn of the handle uh, is a lot more risk there. There is an equation that allows us to estimate um, what the pressure change would be if you take longer than that minimum time. This is an empirical equation that's uh, found in the book, and what it says is that it depends on factors related to, like, the initial water velocity, the time that you're taking to uh, close the valve, the travel distance, and so we won't actually work an example of this. Maybe in some future semester I'll find the time, but uh, this is essentially just kind of like a, uh, an estimation that's been based on observation over time. And if, uh, if you're able to estimate the, uh, the valve closure time, and sometimes valves are closed by electronic servos rather than by human hands, and so then that's kind of like a systems control issue is how quickly that servo is going to be closing an automated valve. Uh, so this formula allows you to calculate less than the worst case scenario because this is only, this formula is only um, in that bad situation where the valve is closed so-called instantaneously, which means less than the round trip travel time. Um, we already from the video saw a few ways to avoid um, the damage associated with the water hammer. You know, the, the damage can be avoided, number one, by the slow closing of the valve or it could be avoided by having a check valve that's cushioned or with a, a slow stroke, uh, a small stroke distance on the check valve or that uh, kind of shock wave that we saw in the video. Another solution that's been used over time is a surge tank. And what that is is just kind of a temporary location where any increased water volume can rise inside of the surge tank rather than having to go all the way back to the main reservoir. And so you can think of it as just uh, like an intermediate location where the water levels can fluctuate. And um, you can see that this distance that the water level is going to rise depends on the volume of water that's going to have to travel into some expansion location. And so uh, it's going to depend on the cross-sectional area of the pipe and the length from this surge tank back to the reservoir. But then also it depends on the diameter and the cross-sectional area of the surge tank itself. So this formula would tell you how high the water level is going to rise. So let's use the same numbers that we had before. Let's say that we want to uh, prevent the damage of a water hammer in our system that we considered, where we have the 4-inch pipe and we know what the initial flow velocity is going to be. So we can use this equation to tell us um, if the surge depth can only be one feet, like if that's the maximum height that we have for the water level to rise, what we want to find in this case is how big of a diameter of that surge tank would be required. So in this formula, what we're going to be solving for is the uh, cross-sectional area of the tank. And then once you know the area of the tank, then you can calculate the diameter from that area. So S, in this case, remember the, uh, the S value, the maximum surge depth is just a single foot. The velocity is known, the length is known, so I'd like you to calculate the cross-sectional area of the tank that would be required to keep that uh, depth below a foot. So we can rearrange this maximum surge height equation to solve for the area. 
and it turns out that the to get the area we need of 256 square feet, the diameter of that circular surge tank would have to be 18 feet. So probably a one foot surge height capacity is pretty unrealistic, otherwise you're ending up with a surge tank that's uh, so large in diameter just to accommodate the volume. I mean, this is all about there's a certain volume of water that's going to rush in uh, to this surge tank to prevent the shock wave from propagating. Because if you can have the water go into the surge tank rather than expanding the pipe, then you're essentially stopping the uh, shock wave dead in its tracks. Remember, this, this whole thing was because the pressure increase caused the pipe to expand. And if we have the, uh, the water go into a tank that's open to the atmosphere rather than expanding the pipe, then the uh, shock wave won't continue. All right, let's uh, close with one last look at these announcements. Your homework assignment is due on Tuesday the 19th, and uh, a little bit further down the road, that exam is going to have some Excel questions. So I'd suggest practicing the, uh, the method so that it, it, it becomes uh, really second nature to you for the, uh, for the test.